Ooh, so quiet. I love it. Hi, how was lunch? Was it good? Welcome back. No, it's good. It's good. Welcome back. Were you all in here? Yes, we're good. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. All right, let's get started. Let's get started. Our next talk uh, features Stephen Novella, Harriet Hall. We've added some names. Paul Ofit, Scott Lillianfield, and uh, David Gorski is our moderator. It's the psychology of pseudoscience in medicine. Uh, here's the limerick. We often scoff at the painful reliance of a psychology's regretful appliance of stuff that's not true, but hey, what can you do? There's big bucks in medical pseudoscience. All right, please welcome to the stage Stephen Novella, Harriet Hall, David Gorski, Paul uh, Offit, and Scott Lillianfeld. Thank you. Oh, all right. One of the you know one of the areas of pseudoscience that we see in a lot of what we call complementary and alternative medicine has to do with psychology, and we thought to start this discussion that we would talk about perhaps the most pervasive area um, because it also some of it might not all be quackery. So let's talk about. All right, and the slide's not coming. We're, we're gonna talk about mind-body therapies. Is it, is it showing up? Because I can't see it on my monitor. All right, so there are two definitions that you see before you. One from no, the National no, Center what, for Complementary and yeah. Alternative Medicine. Is it showing? All right. I'll just wing it here. Uh, the, um, the, the definitions both basically talk about interventions for the mind and body or the mind-body connection that can be either therapeutic, relieve symptoms, or you know, improve immune function, improve physiology, whatever, whatever. And there are a whole number of them that range from things like meditation, uh, exercise, um, and even aromatherapy. So I, I think what we'll do is I'll just start by asking each panelist what, the, what they consider, what do they think of when they hear mind-body medicine? What does it mean? Well, in the first place, mind to me means an emergent phenomenon of the physical and chemical processes in the brain. And it's a handy shorthand uh, that covers a lot of things. It doesn't cover everything the brain does because the brain does a lot of automatic housekeeping functions. But I think of the mind as, as um, including anything that consciousness has access to, things like emotions and thoughts and memories. And um, when I was in medical school, our professor of psychiatry told us we could not use the word mind because he thought it led to fuzzy thinking. And um, when somebody tells me I can't do something, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to react. And uh, people will, who know me will understand. I rebelled. And we had to write a term paper. And I wrote the term paper. And I used the word mind over and over and over again throughout the paper. <laughs> I got it back, it was all covered with red marks. He'd underlined every time I'd used the word mind. He'd written nasty notes in the outline, in the, the, the margins. But he gave me an A plus because, <laughs> <laughs> because I had explained what I meant by mind and I justified the way I was using it. And uh, mind is a, is a word that's handy in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Uh, how, how could we say things like, I'll keep that in mind or, I changed my mind if we didn't have a label like that. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a metaphor, like we say, from the bottom of my heart. Well, we know that doesn't have anything to do with that little pump in your chest, but it's very useful in getting ideas across to other people. So when I hear the word mind, I don't think about anything uh, ineffable or uh, immaterial. And it certainly doesn't remind me of, of um, 
a dualistic philosophy or a vitalistic philosophy. And I, I think it's a good word to use as long as, as we understand how we're using it. But I think the, the idea of mind-body medicine is just stupid. <laughs> Because now, 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 Harriet, how do you real, really feel about that? <laughs> uh, because it, it, there is no division. Uh, it's all one thing. Every, things that happen in the mind affect what happens in the body. If you're, if you're afraid, your heart rate speeds up. And things that happen in the body affect the mind. If the body is sending pain signals to the brain, the brain interprets it as suffering, and chronic pain gets uh, turned into uh, depression and uh, hopelessness and mental things. So uh, good medicine always considers mind and body together, and there shouldn't be a separate category. Okay, be before we move on to Scott, we finally have the slide up there. There are the two definitions, one from NCAM. <laughs> And the other one from the NCI Office of Cancer, Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which has the most unfortunate acronym ever, OCAM. <laughs> it's not on the big screen. All right, <laughs> never mind. I give up. I give up. Scott, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess, it's on the screen now. <laughs> Anyway, this is the list here of some of the things that fall under mind-body medicine according to our government. <laughs> so, and you can all see the list now. And we'll leave it up a few more seconds while the discussion continues. So, I'm not sure what mind-body medicine is, to be honest. Um, like Harriet, when I think of mind, I don't think of anything spooky or spiritual or non-material. I, I like her. I, I'm a, what's I guess technical, or non-reductive physicalist. I, I do think the, the mind is what the brain does, or partly does. And I, I don't, when I use the term mind, like Harriet, I use it to refer to an emergent property of lower order neural elements. However, I think that when most people use the term mind-body medicine, they're not using it that way. At least that's my impression. My impression is they're using it in a pretty dualistic way, either implicitly or explicitly. So I, I think one reason that is popular in many circles is this assumption that these interventions, including some of those that are listed there, I'm a little surprised to see cognitive behavioral therapy, which I was trained in, uh, on there. Um, I, I think a lot of people who support these techniques may believe that these methods are working not through the brain, but through some kind of quasi-spiritual, non-material essence. So I don't have any problem with people looking at the efficacy of meditation for anxiety or exercise. In fact, there's some pretty mm -hmm. good evidence I think that exercise is helpful for, for depression. But when I say that m exercise works or cognitive behavioral therapy, which I know fairly well works, what I mean when I say that is I, I think what you're learning to do with cognitive behavioral therapy is you're learning to harness one part of your brain to control another part of your brain. I don't think you're harnessing the mind or some non-material essence to harness the brain, but I, I fear that that's often the implication. I often worry about that that implication is almost left dangling out there because it may be appealing to some people. Paul? Um, I guess I have a very simplistic view of this, um, which is I would define it as that one's emotional state influences your susceptibility to illness or your ability to recover from illness. But I completely agree with Harriet. It's all of one piece. You know, the, I guess the line from Milton's Paradise Lost is the mind can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. I think it's true. And, and you know, the, but it's it's, it, there is to the degree that it's, um, there's a, a physiological response. It is explainable. I mean, so for example, um, you know, you have nerve endings in your thymus and your bone marrow and your spleen. These are immunological organs. It's not surprising then that one can inf learn to, in some ways, influence one's immune system. So um, I, I, I agree with Harriet, though. I think it's certainly all of one piece, and there, it's not, uh, there's not, nothing magical about it. All right, Steve, give us the definitive answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know either. I mean, I don't use the term mind-body medicine because I don't think it has a, a usable definition. It doesn't have what I would call an operational definition. If you have these features and have these occlusionary features, then, then that's considered mind-body medicine. So it's kind of like a wizard's definition, like Gandalf. It means exactly what camp proponents want it to mean, 
at any point in time, nothing more, nothing less. Um, you know, and I agree with Harry, a lot of it comes from the you know, vagaries of the term mind. You know, we can use it as a metaphor. I just sort of sometimes just bypass it by saying, well, I'll keep that in the synaptic connections of the neurons of my neocortex. <laughs> <laughs> Mind tends to flow a little bit easier, so it's a useful shorthand metaphor, but, but when you try to use that as a scientific definition or a clinical definition, you run into trouble because it is a metaphor. It doesn't really have an operational definition. It, it, and to the extent that it has any meaning, it is just the functioning of the brain. The brain, it's not the mind-body. The brain is the body. It's part of the body. It's the same thing. It's just the different parts of the body connecting and working together. And so it's completely artificial, I think, when you really try to break it down to what it might mean. Okay, so you, uh, among this list of therapies, are there any that you consider to be perhaps evidence-based? Well, evidence-based for what? Well I, yeah, I, I, is, well, well, I mean, you can give specific <laughs> indications. So, I mean, there's a lot of things on the list. This is, this is one of the things that drives me crazy with uh, alternative medicine claims is that they're often nonspecific. So there's Tai Chi is on there. Right. And yoga. Those are both exercise. And what the evidence mm -hmm. shows is that they have this, the effects you would predict they would have for exercising and stretching and practicing balance but it, saying exercise isn't as sexy as saying Tai Chi or yoga. But, and so there's study, or meditation's another great one. There's lots of studies on meditation. I've, looked, I've tried to look through so, as much so, of the so literature as I Perhaps we should define meditation. Is well, there a, a science-based definition of meditation? So that's, that's again, that, that, that's the, the rub, is what's the operational definition of meditation? If, so if you look, virtually all of the studies, clinical studies looking at meditation showing it lowers your heart rate and lowers your blood pressure and reduce whatever, reduces your blood sugar and all the wonderful things that meditation does. What they never do is have a control group where you're just relaxing. Uh, so how do I know that meditation or some particular kind of meditation, transcendental meditation or whatever, is any different than me just sitting on the couch and relaxing for the same amount of time? They don't do that study. I'm, I, I have to wonder why. And, and, you know, the two possibilities are not to be, you know, a false dichotomy, but two, two certainly plausible possibilities are one is they're just terrible scientists and they're not asking the obvious question they should be asking, or two is they don't want to know the answer to that question. They want to do the study that shows that transcendental meditation lowers your blood pressure. They don't want to show as well as sitting on the couch and doing nothing. <laughs> so... Uh, although if you're eating Cheetos while you're sitting on the couch, it yeah, might not. Well, if you're eating Cheetos, it doesn't help. So it, that's why the, the, they live for vague definitions. They live in the gray zone because that way it means exactly what they want it to mean and you could never nail them down. It's like nailing jello to the wall, right? You, just, you could never do it because if you have to actually define your variables, it all falls apart because it, 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 it's all marketing. It's not science. It, is, some of the, is some of the ambiguity, Steve, also that some of the proponents of these texts are, are, techniques are not always clear about what they mean about specific versus non-specific effects. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one argument I hear is that if you compare meditation with a relaxation condition, and a few studies have done that, and as yeah. you know, the results are kind of equivocal. Yeah. So let's say you do that, and the results are kind of, eh, you know, not so good. So they might say, yeah, but sure, what you're calling a placebo effect is in part what I think is yeah. part of the technique. And yeah. I'm not defending that, but I just wonder if part of it is just an ambiguity about what actually the active component is. Is, that, is Part of the problem, I think, is just the theoretical mechanisms are, are often exactly. rather vague. That's the other shell game that they play, yeah. is when you show that they have, quote unquote, only placebo effects, they go, well, there you go. Placebo effects right. are mind-body medicine. So that's right. one, that becomes their definition of mind-body medicine, because sure. that's the placebo effect is the mind affecting the body, even though it really isn't. So they, yeah, they, they just turn the whole logic of scientific research on its head by saying that only having a placebo effect is a real effect, even though it's mainly nonspecific or illusory effects and it's not a real effect, but it fits within their fiction that they've erected about mind-body medicine, which is really what it is, just a narrative, I guess if you want to really break it down. But see, I, I think, here's what I would say, it's just because something doesn't work better than placebo doesn't mean the placebo doesn't work. I mean, you could argue, as you just did, I think, Steve, that, it, that if you take all of this, whether you call it Tai Chi or Qigong or, or 
meditation or yoga or whatever, mm -hmm. that, 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 that you can at times at least define that you are affecting the release of stress mediators which have an effect on the immune system or have an effect on blood pressure. And so that's what that is. I mean, I think that there is a physiological basis to that that is, is effective or can be effective. It's just the part that's upsetting, and I think it's upsetting to Steve too, is, is that it's sort of sold as something mystical right. and greater and magical. And that, that's, I think, where, where we're in danger lies. Yeah, let's, let's call it, sorry, let's just call it what it is. It's relaxation, it's exercise, it's stretching. Everything else is the ritual bullshit that surrounds the, the, <laughs> the actual thing that's happening. And then you, get, you, you end up getting these very few basic effects, relaxation, massage, whatever, repackaged over and over again with the different BS around it. And that's, that con that's con sows confusion. Science is supposed to winnow away the confusion to what's actually happening. They're going in the opposite direction. They're embellishing the, the real effect with, with fake stuff. Yeah, most, think, most of the things on that list are feel-good things. They, uh, they make, they're like comfort measures. They make people subjectively feel good. And there are very few things on that list that have been shown to have any really significant effect on the outcome of illnesses. Now, some of them may have some physiologic effects, but are they big enough effects to really make a difference? Uh, there's no, no real good evidence that there is for most of those. Yeah, I think for CBT, kind of behavior therapy, I think there is some. I think even there, there's some question about whether the cognitive parts, which involves sort of restructuring the way we think about things, add a lot above and beyond the behavioral parts. That's a controversial yeah. issue right now. But I think there's some evidence, pretty good evidence, that CBT is efficacious for depression and, and also good for prophylaxis of well, yeah, depression. Yeah, I was actually about to ask about uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. You're, you know, it is used for many, in, you know, many indications. So how does it get lumped in with mind-body medicine? I, I, I mean, Steve and I have talked about this sort of thing for a lot of other things. This is basically, uh, and I'd like you to comment on this, this is basically a rebranding of potentially science-based therapy. Again, I, th I wonder, I don't know, I I'm sort of bewildered by it, but I do wonder if, again, some of it reflects this implicit dualism that the cognitive part, when you're changing people's thoughts, you're actually, you are going through their minds, but not their brains. I wonder if that's almost the assumption that is being made here. So that what's what well, makes it a mind-body technique is you're, you're changing their, their mental processes, which somehow is not material. Again, all of us on the panel would agree that doesn't make any sense. But in, intuitively, I, I wonder if that's the way a lot of people think about it. So, I think so, they lumped oh, in the cognitive behavioral therapies because they needed something on their list that really worked. <laughs> 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 so. So, um, yeah, so um, can there be mind-body medicine without dualism as an assumption? Does the whole category require? I don't think it requires a dualism, and just, you know, just to define what we're talking about, du dualism, there's different flavors of it, but basically it's any philosophy of mind, uh, and Daniel Dennett is here, so I'm sure he's going to talk about this, but it's any philosophy of mind that says that the mind is somehow something other than just what the brain is doing. It's, it's something right. more. Cartesian dualism means it says it's completely separate. There's this spiritual thing outside of, metaphysical thing outside of the brain. Um, but there's other, there are other types of dualism that blur the lines even further. So I think the blurring of those lines with dualism is useful for including whatever you want into the category, keeping it nice and vague so it can mean whatever you want. But you can have a concept of mind-body medicine that doesn't involve dualism. All you're saying is that Again, like, like Paul said, your emotions affect your health. It's like, okay, that's true in a very trivial sense, and we know that it's true because the brain is your health, it is your body, and it's all connected, you know? So, of course, your stress hormones are released by stress. Um, and that has an effect on the physiology of your body, which, you know, can affect all sorts of things. So it's true in a way that's reductionist scientific that we've known for decades, that's not controversial. But to the extent that it's, to, 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 that it's true in that sense, that it has no meaning and it's not dualistic, when you go beyond what we know from biology and physiology, then they start to incorporate dualism to expand their list to whatever they want, like guided imagery or things that are, that are more than just you know, the, the basics yeah. of relaxation and exercise and massage and whatever. Yeah, you know, there was, there was one study that was done um, in 1957. It was sort of a landmark study done by John Imboden, who was a, um, a researcher at, uh, at Johns Hopkins University. He did this study at Fort Detrick, and what he did was, and it was fortuitous, he, he went to an army barracks at Fort Detrick, Maryland. He did a sort of series of psychological profiles defining then these, these, uh, these uh, uh, soldiers 
um, as being sort of more or less depressed. And then, then the fortuitous part came was that was right during the big Asian flu pandemic of 1957, which then swept across the barracks and then affected those soldiers differently. And what he found that was interesting, because it was really very clear that those who were more depressed were more likely to get sick, that when they got sick, they were more likely to develop symptoms for longer, and they were more likely to shed virus for longer, I think which served in some ways as a proof that mood can determine illness. So I don't think it's trivial, I, you know, it's, but it's, and it's harnessable at some level, but you know, I agree with Steve, it's, you know, we sort of surround it with this kind of mystical bullshit, right. it's painful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but we know that, I mean, it's stress, emo depression, <clears throat> emotional stress releases corticosteroids which suppress the immune system. We, we completely re reduced that at axis, we know exactly what's happening. There's no mystery there whatsoever. Yeah. No, I agree, I mean, if I could just go back to one quick point, sort of, that resonates with what Paul was saying before is, I think one mistake we sometimes make, and I think I was guilty of it too for a while, is asking the question, is technique X effective or does it work? And I think, and also relates to what Steve's talking about, as part of our role as skeptics, is I think it's to be clear thinkers and to sort of make distinctions. So I think it's, I've come around to the view that's not a very meaningful question. If we ask, does X work? Well, what does that mean? Does it mean work better than doing nothing, which oftentimes is not, as we know, a very informative comparison, especially given placebo effects and a host of other nonspecific factors that can account. Does it mean working better than a placebo? Does it mean working better than a rival intervention? Does it mean work, working better than treatment as usual in terms of what's typical? It can mean any or all of those things. And, and I think part of the problem with mind-body medicine is sometimes it has been vague about what that question actually means. And going back to Steve's point, I think the question of whether something works above and beyond placebo is it's often a pretty rigorous test, especially in, in my own field of psychotherapy. It's actually a controversial issue. First of all, it's really hard to get a, a good placebo control. Well, well that's actually what you've just brought up something I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. How do you test, you know, one of the things that CAM practitioners will say is, well, you can't do a randomized d double blind trial on these interventions. You can't test and them, you know, how do you, how can you say they don't work? So can you test these with, you know, what's the most rigorous way that you can test some of these? We could talk about, say, cognitive behavioral therapy, but you could pick any other one if you have, if you thought, how would you test it? What's the control? How do you control for the placebo effect? Like, how do you make it as rigorous as possible? Well, you definitely can't do a, or it's almost impossible, many people would argue, to do a strict double-blinded test of psychotherapy. Sure. You can do a single blind sometimes, but, double, um, but even there, it's, it's really hard because typically both client and patient, both client, patient, and therapist know who's in which group and they know what to expect and so on, so it's impossible to do it strictly blinded. On the other hand, you can st still use randomization and one of the old principles I always teach my students in psychology is if, if you can't eliminate a source of error, at least try to measure it. And certainly <clears throat> you can get closer to a blinded trial by measuring expectancies. You can measure clients' expectancies, therapists' expectancies at the beginning, throughout treatment, at the end of treatment, and so on, and often use that as sort of statistical covariates. In terms of psychotherapy, what is a good control condition, say, for cognitive behavioral therapy? Boy, that's a tough one. Uh, that's why I asked it. <laughs> it, is really, it is really hard. What people have typically done is use what are called attention placebo control groups, and attention <clears throat> placebo control groups, typically what people do is, rather than actually do therapy itself, they will talk to a therapist, typically with the same level of training and expertise, for the same amount of time, but they will not do strict cognitive behavioral therapy. They'll talk about their problems, use emotional support, and so on. And usually what you find, by the way, when you do that, when you compare a reasonably well-supported therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy with an attention placebo control group, you typically still get a difference, but it's not as great as the difference with a, say, a weightless control condition where the person's getting no treatment at all. So the difference often goes down by about a half or so. But one of the controversies there, which maybe gets to the question you're getting at, um, is, are you taking out too much? Because after all, part of what mm -hmm. works in psychotherapy is support. Part of what works is the ability to talk to a, a caring professional. So that's always the question. Again, to me, and I agree fully with Steve on this, to me a lot of this is what are you claiming? That it's the nature of the claims you are making. If you are claiming that your technique works better than just talking to somebody for a particular period of time, then you better damn well have good evidence for it. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand you're claiming that, okay, this is just a, a technique that works, we don't quite know why, it helps to talk to someone for a period of time, 
then it may not be as important. But the fact of the matter is almost always in my field of psychotherapy, when people are proponents of a particular therapeutic technique, they are claiming that that technique has some specific techniques, some specific stuff in it that other therapies don't. Any other comments? Well, I mean, just as an example, I, mean, I think the one for me that I always like to go to with, with CBT is like the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing where you, know, you, you follow the, the finger of the therapist and moving your eyes is supposed to get you to integrate the cognitive therapy better. It's based upon a completely nonsensical notion of how the brain works. And again, there is almost an, this inherent dualism in there where you're, the mind is reprogramming the brain in some way. It's all nonsense. But the, so the... the, the uh, the, the researchers who claim, or the pro proponents of that, who, who EMDR, who claim there's a specific benefit to doing that, that's something you can control for. And you can compare it to CBT without EMDR, and you, you know, it may be hard to fully blind it, but you could at least do some kind of controlled comparison between the two. And what they don't do is they don't show that there's a specific added benefit to that isolated variable component. They really just show that there's a non-specific benefit of introducing something novel and doing the, the, you know, the interaction between the therapists. So they haven't isolated the variable. And when you do, you tend to isolate those variables. They don't have any specific benefit. So then they fall back on saying, yeah, but there's a non-specific non benefit, and that is equivalent to working. And again, you know, I, I agree, uh, as Scott says, they, they have a vague defi definition of what it means to work to the point that placebo effects or non-specific effects equal working, and so it's a win-win. They can't ever possibly lose. And when you can't ever prove that something doesn't work, then you can't prove that it does work either, in a way. I mean, they're not doing the, they're not, it becomes non-falsifiable, therefore it's not science. And that's what, that's what we get interested in, you know, when they're going outside the boundaries of science by essentially rendering their claims immune to falsification. Yeah, quick, quick, real quick note about that in terms of rendering claims immune to falsification. One of my favorite examples of an ad hoc hypothesis in science that does that actually concerns EMDR, I'm moving desensitization reprocessing. So someone did a study, if there had been a couple of these studies where they have compared EMDR with the, the eyes wagging back and forth, and then they, and there's more to EMDR than that, like also processing the memory. So they had that, had a condition, a typical EMDR condition where the person's following the therapist's eyes, and then they had a control condition, which was a fixed eye movement condition where everything else was the same, except the client was staring directly at a wall at a spot without the eyes moving. And it worked just as well, there was no difference at all. Uh, they both worked better than a weightless control, but they worked equally well, so which would seem to refute, at least to me, or call into strong question, the theoretical mechanism underlying EMDR. Well, no, not so fast, because the proponent of EMDR, the main proponent of EMDR, actually wrote on a listserv, I think I have this email somewhere, saying, no, that actually vindicates my hypothesis about EMDR, <laughs> because when the person is staring at a dot, the eyes want to move. <laughs> so, so at some level, it's still working because the eyes at some unconscious level are actually moving because the brain is simulating the eye. So again, it becomes, I mean, is it possible? Yeah, I guess. But it becomes impossible to falsify it after a while. You looked like you wanted to say yeah, something. No, I just, so. just, 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 just want to say that looking um, over here. We're, um, you know, certainly as, as a conventional therapist, I, I would argue in our hospital, we're certainly not above practicing placebo medicine. I think we do it subtly. When you, when you come into our hospital and you see one of our doctors, they have on a white coat with red stenciling, um, not a T-shirt that says Iggy and the Squirrels on, on the back of it. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, we have these big machines that make fancy noises when we give medicine. Or the machine that goes ping. The machine yes. that goes ping in the night. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, when, we, when we give a medicine to a patient, we often say, I really think this is going to work for you. That all matters. I, you know, I think that all at some level has an effect. So and it's subtle, but I think it's, we all do this at some level. So, it, that's been studied to show that it works. Right. In fact, they, the more expensive a medicine is, the more it's yeah. viewed right, as being right. good. So, so another aspect of mind-body is that it, it, it's evolving. And, and in fact, on the, the NCAM strategic plan for the last five years is now refers to it as mind and body medicine, which, uh, and, and it's expanded to include things like therapeutic touch, energy medicine, you know, like glommed on to all of this. So, so I guess my question here is what is it about, my, you know, mind-body medicine, whether you accept the concept or not, that, that it attracts so much woo. <laughs> it's like, I, I mean, and how can you, how can we stop that? I mean, you know, energy medicine is about as quackery, as, as much quackery as you can get. Yeah. So, it's hardcore. 
Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if, you, if there was really such a thing as mind over matter, if you could think yourself out of illness? I mean, that's a, a very seductive concept. I agree. I think it's a lot of things that we've been talking about. It sort of it lends itself to the woo, you know, to, to uh, a lot of alternative practices because it deals with vague definitions, because it's essentially a rebranding of nonspecific and placebo effects. So it's a setup. It's actually a brand that was created to create a space for things like energy medicine and things that are not scientific. So it's, it's not a surprise. Yeah. But, but let me ask this. So the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, which is next to our hospital, I'm at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the Division of Oncology has a Reiki master. So, yeah, so you yeah, can go I, there and you, you, know, you, get your, you get your healing energies manipulated. Now, it's nonsense, but you could argue that, that, you know, that in that patient who is stressed out, this is decreasing stress mediators, and it's a value, and it's certainly of, of low risk right. and low burden. It just promotes magical thinking. How, how about I give you my, my I'm going to step out of the moderator role for like 10 seconds, 30 <laughs> seconds. My answer to that is I don't have a problem with Reiki masters in the same way that I don't have a problem with chaplains. Because if it's mystical religious thinking, they, should, they could be treated the same way. Reiki master is a chaplain. And anyone? <laughs> if I it's agree. marketed that way, but, yeah. it, but if it's... But, but, saying, that, but that's not is, what they do. But that's not what they do, that's right. That's not what they do. They, okay, they, I'm moderator again. I'm sorry, <laughs> they, they, they spin it into something that's real medicine, you know? And I've, because you, you, I think you recently pointed this out, the universities that promote <clears throat> Reiki, and I, looked at Yale's website, you know, the, the Yale Hospital does it, but they were very careful in how they worded it. They made no actual medical claims. It was just some people feel better when they have somebody wave their hands over them, you know. And so they were very vague about it, which, which had to be deliberate. They didn't make any actual claims. But then other, other hospitals and other centers really go oh, way over the line and say this is a system of medicine it will it'll, well, well, it, dr oz yeah it'll promote healing yeah well, once you start saying healing you know then that's that's a, another vague term that doesn't mean anything but it's it's really it's, it's uh, like perfect like, like wellness yeah wellness <laughs> yeah, it promotes your inner wellness okay so there's lots of ways that you could make pseudo non-scientific claims that sound good as good marketing good branding um, but you know that is avoiding anything anything specific, and then there are other sites still that actually say this will cure your cancer. You know, then they go all the way to this is going to treat your disease, and that's way over the line. Um, that's where you're getting into the real hardcore quackery. So it's a continuum. It's all you know the whole you see the whole spectrum. Then you know I, which is why I I don't accept things like Reiki because. It is on the spectrum. It's part of the whole thing. And you know, as Paul said, it promotes uncritical thinking. Yeah, we can't underestimate that, you know, how much harm that that does. Because people get on that, they think, oh, it's, this is good for me to relax as an adjunct to my treatment. And then the next step is, you know, this is, I know this sounds like a slippery slope argument, but this is how they do it. The acupuncturist. Well, I was about to say, what about acupuncture? Yeah, they, they get you in there and say, oh, yeah, this is, you know, they make all the nonspecific claims that they can slip past the academic, you know, goalpost. And then, but when you're in the office, then they're like, oh, yeah, this is going to, you know, align your chakras and cure your cancer. Then they really hit you. It's definitely the Trojan horse. You know, David and I have used that analogy before. The, the soft stuff that we're like, ah, okay, who cares about that? It's touchy-feely, it's nice. The soft stuff really is the Trojan horse in order to, to get in the real heart. But you know, in their heart of hearts, they believe they can cure cancer with acupuncture. And that's what they tell you once they have you in their office and they're not trying to sell themselves to the dean of a medical school who, who, who isn't going to buy that. So it really is a deliberate deception and, and we can't fall for it. Yeah, I mean, I think... So getting to your question, why is it appealing? So, well, well yeah, it, 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 yeah, that was the question. So why is it so appealing? Or why is the thought, I mean, obviously it's very appealing that if you, you can think yourself well, especially if you're sick. I think for the same reason the chaplain's appealing. There's this notion that there's something greater than you out there that can sort of you know, reach down and make you feel better or be better. I, you know what I'm saying? That it's sure. just that incredible need to believe there is something greater than yourself. I think that's what part of the appeal. Yeah, I think some, I agree. I think, I think two other pieces. One, again, maybe this is more of my psychological background. I think, again, not to harp too much on the dualism issue, but I think it is pretty deeply embedded in the way most people think. Paul Bloom's argued this, that a lot of us are implicitly dualists. And so developmentally, we know that kids are dualists. If you ask preschoolers, for example, questions like, what, it's interesting, you ask them, like, what part of you 
can do a math problem, like do add stuff together, most of them will say the brain. But if you ask them what part of you loves your mother, they'll say the mind. Or, you know, they don't. So, and, and Bloom and others have argued that there's a bit of this residue in all of us. Or is it just cultural? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think it's both. Uh, I think it, it may be cultural. I think it, it may also be a natural unfolding of development in terms of our understanding of the way our, our, our bodies work. I think the other piece, of course, is that I'm admittedly the one non-MD on this panel, but the one thing I always hear, and I'm sure you folks have heard this too, is this sort of complaint that traditional Western medicine is kind of cold, uncaring, <laughs> unfeeling, harsh, and I, I reject that view, but I understand it's a widespread view. And I, and certainly there's a, a core of truth in it. Obviously, we're coming around to the view that this, some of these placebo effects that Paul talks about, like being caring and having good rapport and so on, are an important part of medicine. It's not a, a dichotomy. It's actually part of good medicine is being caring and being supportive. But I think looking at that list that was up there before, one of the things that I, it's hard for me not to note, is that a lot of them are kind of <laughs> feel good things, a lot of them involve touch and mm -hmm. being relaxed and, and mellowing out and getting in touch, I mean, it makes, makes me feel good kind of thinking about it, right? <laughs> Meditation, relaxing, aromatherapy, it's all kind of nice. And I, I think it, to a lot of people, it, it reminds them of what bothers them, rightly or wrongly, about traditional Western medicine, which may often seem sort of cold and impersonal. It has that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. Again, to me, the answer to that is to make sure that Western medicine is caring and is, is not cold and unfeeling rather than to resort right. to unscientific claims. But I, look, I can understand the temptation. Part of it might be due to a common understanding of something that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's psychosomatic medicine. You know, there is a thing called somatization disorder where people's mental uh, discomfort is expressed as physical symptoms. And most people have heard about psychosomatic things. I used to belong to the, psychosomatic, the American Psychosomatic Association. And I remember reading things uh, in my less skeptical days. Uh, for instance, they looked at people who had stomach ulcers and they interviewed them and they got all of them to say something to the effect that that burns me or that really makes me sick to my stomach. So they thought there was something symbolic going on that caused ulcers. And uh, I don't remember the studies ever having control groups and asking lots of people the same questions and seeing how many of them said that something burned them. And they would say things like, people with chronic back pain will say something to the effect that they'd like to run away from that problem. And people who have uh, heard that kind of thing and been uh, indoctrinated into that kind of thinking uh, find mind-body medicine a lot more convincing than most of us do. All right, I think we're, we're, we got about 15 minutes left and we want to have t time for a fair number of questions. So our MC will... If we want to form a line here, I'll grab the first one right there, but let's form a line if you want a question just so we don't block anyone's view. So feel free to come on up. We got a little bit of time here. Here's the first one. I'm interested to hear uh, you guys take on uh, detailing the placebo effect and people's popular conception of exactly what's going on there. I seem to run into people that literally think that their mind is healing their body and that that can go towards things like uh, outcomes in cancer. Okay. Um, how widespread, is that just my anecdotal you know, perception and are there good numbers on how widespread that is? You know, I'll just I'll start by saying something very quickly and simply. I think most people, when they hear the term placebo effect, think that you are dismissing them. They think that, right. that you're saying that this is just a trivial thing. It's all in your mind. It's really not real, and it's a dismissive. It's it's I think perceived as a dismissive term. But that it, that's my sense. I think I agree. Right. Or it's perceived as the mind healing the body. That's the other way it's interpreted. When when it's like a positive thing, either it's dismissive if you if, or, it's, or or it's exaggerated. It's, it's yeah. exaggerated. So. But you're right, that's not what it is. I mean, it's been studied enough that we know that there isn't any actual healing going on. There's no physiological effect. It's all the perception. It's all you know, illusory effects like regression to the mean, et cetera. So, um, and again, we get into the problem of, of the operational definition of what is actually being measured as a placebo effect versus what are the components of that go into that placebo effect. It's a lot of things, but it's not 
a mind over matter, matter actual healing. But in my personal anecdotal experience, 100% of the people that I talk to thinks that's what it is. And that's, that's the, the opposite of the truth. It's actually not what it is. It's the one thing that it isn't. Because we know that because researchers who have tried to show that's what it is have ended up proving that there's no real healing effect going on, that it really is all just transient, subjective, illusory effects. So I had thoughts to you, so maybe it's my own ignorance, but it's been a little while since I checked this other trap, but I thought there was some evidence suggesting that placebo effects sometimes can be blocked by like naloxone or other opiate blockers. Yeah, like so... That. Wouldn't that suggest there's some... Learning genuine, of endorphin release. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, so I think you right. have to carve... The other, because the other, that's a good point. The other point is you have to say the placebo effect for what? Now, if you're talking about cancer survival, there's no placebo effect. If you're talking about pain... The problem, the thing is pain is subjective and it's an experience in the brain that's, it's a complicated biological experience with a lot of components and there's a lot of built-in ways of modifying the pain experience at multiple levels, at the peripheral level and at the central level and there's different components of pain that are modifiable by different brain mechanisms. There's an emotional component to pain, there's an attentional component to pain and there's a tactile, a feeling component to pain and they're all manipulable manipulatable, but with, with, with the functioning of your brain. So yes, when you're in a good mood, pain doesn't bother you as much as when you're in a bad mood. If you look at your right arm and your left arm hurts, your left arm will hurt less because you're diverting your attention from the arm that hurts. And I'm sure, you know, yes, dopamine and endorphins, yeah, those are, that's how the brain works. And so that when, if you measure how the brain works, those are the things that are happening when your brain is modifying its own perception of pain but again, that kind of all reduces down to a no-duh, kind of obviously that's the way the brain works kind of mechanism. Uh, but it does mean, and this is the big question we always get about placebo effects, if patients feel better, who cares? And I agree in that if you're talking about subjective symptoms, it's, o it's okay. And, and but in, from, in my opinion, and this has kind of come up you know, so, already. So does that mean you're going to send your patients for acupuncture if they don't have no, any? No, no, so what my approach is that's good bedside manner. Mm -hmm. you know, that's something that you know, we've been doing for hundreds of years before science-based medicine. That was all we had was good bedside manner. That's you know, just the touchy-feely part of having a positive therapeutic interaction, you know, just practical ways of getting people to deal with their pain. You know, again, pain is a psychological experience in many ways. It's all part of standard chronic pain management because yes, pain is psychological. Um, but again, they try to spin it into something magical, something more than it is by fuzzy definitions and by really just ignoring the reductionist, our reductionist understanding, scientific understanding of what pain actually is. I mean, one other case, real quickly, and, I, and I'm sure you know this much better yeah. than I do, but where I think of a, a physiological basis for placebo effect is the work on sham surgery for Parkinson's, which I think mm -hmm. is held up pretty well. So if you, for example, do a, a uh, a sham surgery with people with Parkinson's, that is you, you actually don't do any, I guess they actually open up the skull but don't actually do anything, yeah. right? Um, what you will see is that the tremors will go down and uh, there's actually at least a short term, doesn't last very long, I guess, but a short term yeah. uh, mm. relief in symptoms and, and it's actually a physiological improvement in symptoms. Right. And some of that probably, and I believe the evidence suggests this, it's dopaminergically mediated. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's very involved in hope. So when the person, feels they're getting the sham surgery, they don't know which condition they're assigned to, they start getting a boost in morale, their dopamine starts squirting out, and that actually, of course, Parkinson's is a yeah. dopaminergic illness, it actually results in a short-term improvement in the symptoms, which is physiological. Yeah. So in, in a sense, it's a placebo effect, of course, because it's, it's an artifact of hope and morale, but it's, it's a genuine physiological effect that produces dopamine increase, which in turn alleviates the symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah, I agree. I, I've okay. reviewed that literature as well, and that's my understanding as well. But again, so just like pain, there is, or like corticosteroids, you know, when, when there's an actual neurotransmitter that, you know, it, that responds to emotion, then, and that neurotransmitter sure. has effects, or that hormone, whatever's being released, <clears throat> then yes, it can have the effects that it has. So again, it kind of reduces down to known mechanisms. But as you say, it's short-lived because the emotional component is short-lived and kind of goes hand in hand with that. So it, I still think that research is preliminary, but even if we just accept it at face value, it, it's, it's just another thing like pain where there's a transient effect because it, it's, it's directly resulting from brain function. Next, should we go on to the next yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is one about the psychology of what goes on in a person's mind when they see an alternative medicine person versus a doctor. The common thing in Australia is they say the doctors 
are greedy and they want my money. <laughs> and they ask, they form... They, and, and the alternative medicine doc isn't. Right. <laughs> so in Australia, the situation is that the doctor cannot benefit financially from the advice they give. So they cannot own a pharmacy and they cannot sell you medications. And yet, in my experience, everybody I've spoken to who has gone to see an alternative medicine practitioner is after an examination told there's something wrong with your liver. Luckily, I have some liver tablets that will <laughs> cost you only $90. And yet, they say that the doctors are in it for the money when the alternative medicine people take more. Over to you. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it completely flipped it around. But it's true. The same is true in the U.S., by the way, where we're getting the next speaker up here, is that the ethical sort of standard has shifted to where physicians can't own the lab that they send their patients to or the MRI scan that they send their patients to. They can't essentially do self-referrals where they have a conflict of interest, right. where they make money off of doing stuff or making specific recommendations to you. It's not an absolute rule or law, but the ethics are definitely moving in that direction in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. in my experience, pretty significantly. And it varies by state. Yeah, it sure. varies by state. I'm, I'm glad you guys brought up the subject of pain because, I mean, that's the sort of the area, the area of chronic pain is uh, the area where, as much of a skeptic as I am, that's where I sort of like to start to look at other areas because I've struggled with chronic pain, people in my family have, and often there's just not enough satisfaction to be gotten when you see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And so you want to look like, is there something, anyway, that I could do? And I guess uh, it's a bit off topic, but I'm wondering, is medical science making advances to learn more about pain? Is this something that maybe we could get more happiness out of real bona fide medicine from in the future. I guess I, I can go if, if anyone else will. Um, so I mean, the short answer is yes. I mean, pain is a very active area of research. We're learning, you. You know, we're learning stuff about it all the time. And again, like good old reductionist science, you know, the, which chemicals are getting released in, you know, in response to trauma that increases or decreases the amount of pain being generated or being experienced. You know, exec exactly how the, the, what are the neuroanatomical correlates of different components of pain. We actually know a lot about it and we're learning more about it. We're finding new targets that are really interesting for maybe new pharmaceutical approaches. And at the other end, you know, pain as a specialty, which does intersect with my specialty of neurology, although I do, and I do have kind of, I treat migraine and I treat neuropathic pain, so I do have a little bit of a clinical interest in, in chronic pain. So there is um, a huge psychological component, and that, that is part of any treat management of chronic pain. Any pain clinic, you know, all the ones that I know of personally, have a, psychi a psychiatrist or a psychologist in the clinic that's part of the multidisciplinary approach to pain. And there's lots of studies going on looking at how can we get people. That's why I know about the fact that if you look at the other arm, your pain goes down, because I read a study about it a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of legitimate scientific interest in pain. It's a very complicated biological and psychological phenomenon. And there's also, it's a huge, there's a lot of financial incentive, you know, for pharmaceutical companies to learn about pain. It's a big, big, big problem. And while we have a lot of options, we don't have enough. We absolutely mm -hmm. need more, absolutely. So it, you're going to see, you know, in, increasing options in the future. The alternative medicine people are nibbling around the edges with nonspecific effects that are, you will get also as part, and this has also been studied, you get the same placebo effects out of real medicine. You don't need to get the fake magic shit in order to get the placebo <laughs> effects. So why do it? You know, you just get, get, get the... Re yeah, you, well, it's not, it really isn't, because if you look at it, it's really not cost-effective, because they don't... It, if you, upfront costs may be less, but if you look at cost-effectiveness, it actually is less cost-effective, because it's not as efficient. Although they're doing a lot of stuff that doesn't work. And they also suck you in for a lot of recurrent treatments that are unnecessary. Whereas, in the, cause largely because it's cash on the barrel. A lot of it's outside of insurance companies. Insurance companies, I'm not going to defend them. They have, they're a huge pain in my ass. But they do, keep you, they do have an incentive to keep you efficient co and cost effective. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, they, what their interests are the patient's and medicine's best interest. Although I would, I'm sorry, just quickly. Uh, one quick, again, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think there was a clear bright line between the alternative practitioner and the conventional practitioner. I mean, I had microfracture surgery on my knee a few years ago, and my University of Pennsylvania trained, you know, orthopedist, sports medicine orthopedist, recommended that for my pain I should take chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine. Now, if you look at that, this is actually something that's been studied. I mean, there's no evidence that it works any better than placebo for the pain of osteoarthritis. Um, 
you know, but he did that. He did that because I think he, he is doing what many, what, what many conventional practitioners are doing. They see this as something that it's a marketplace. They think that there's a man, demand for this, and, there's, you know, and so he asked for this. Now, you could argue that, that, um, that by taking this kind of, if I had done that and not actually looked up this, been such a jerk to look up the studies to see that it actually doesn't work better than placebo, if I had believed in him, believed in him as, as a guru, um, and that would have avoided my taking NSAIDs or, or COX-2 inhibitors, that there may have been some value in that. Maybe I would have learned to release my own endorphins by believing this was going to work. I mean, it's, I guess that's possible, but it is a slippery slope. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Maybe, yeah, we should have one more. Along the, <coughs> excuse me, along the s same lines as uh, pain therapy, um, in regards to like mirror box therapy where you're trying to treat the pain experienced in the phantom limb, where does that fall in line in, 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 in that spectrum? Are, is the mechanism understood behind that? Do we question whether or not that's effective therapy for treating pain in that regard? You're talking about Vij like Ramachandran's work on mirror box therapy for phantom limb, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Does anyone? Steve? Go ahead. You, yeah. Do you know about it? Yeah, my understanding is it's promising, but I think there's been my, maybe you know, I think there have been some recent failures to replicate that. But I yeah. think, in, in principle, I, I think what you're trying to do, as I understand, is you're, you're trying to sort of harness brain plasticity. You're trying to get yeah. another part of the brain, <clears throat> which is recognizing a limb that's not there um, as getting it to understand, and maybe I'm, anthrop well, I guess it's called a neurological fallacy, I'm referring to part of the brain as a person, but uh, getting a part of the brain to understand that that limb is no longer there, but I, I think yeah, yeah. some of the recent research suggests that it doesn't work as well as people initially thought. Yeah, I mean, the clinical data is, amb is I think, okay. preliminary yeah. and uh, ambiguous, but the, the idea here is that, if, like, a phantom limb is when you, like, if you have an amputation, for example, it's, it's essentially a mismatch between your brain's model of your physical body and the physical body that's there. And every permutation of that has been described clinically. You can have supernumerary phantom limbs that aren't really, don't really exist. You can have part of your body that you don't think is part of you, or you could have a phantom limb that is no longer there, which is the most common syndrome. And the problem is, is when your brain, you know, it's not getting that input. And this is a generic phenomenon that we see. When part of the brain ceases to get sensory feedback or the input that it normally has and keeping itself in homeostasis, it goes off the rails sometimes. Um, so like for example, if you have a visual, if you lose your sight, you can hold your visual cortex may start hallucinating and just generating its own stimulation. Same thing, your brain says, all right, there's, there's no limb there, it's not getting the feedback, so it just sort of generates its own feedback and that could be painful sometimes, you could feel like your hand is clenched or something. And so it's just ways of tricking the brain into not doing that, you know, into mm -hmm. basically no longer creating these phantom experiences, and it, does, it is trying to provoke uh, plasticity, is this, which means that the, that's the brain adapting to changing sensory input. Uh, and simply. sadly, we are out of time. Thank, I would like to thank the panel. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.